It's now my great privilege and pleasure to introduce the 2016 Malcolm L. Peterson Honor Lecture. The title of the lecture today is Progress in Improving Healthcare Delivery, and the honorary lecturer is Timothy G. Ferris, MD, MPH. Tim is Senior Vice President for Population Health Management at Massachusetts General Hospital, the Massachusetts General Physician Organization, Partners Healthcare in Boston. You can read his full, well, much of his full biography on page four of the program. I'll highlight he's the Associate Professor of Medicine, Harvard Medical School. He leads Partners Healthcare's Pioneer Accountable Care Organization, the ACO. He has over 90 publications in leading journals, including New England Journal of Medicine. He is, has served on a number of uh, national committees on the Institute of Medicine, uh, AHRQ, the National Quality Forum. But I think most importantly is to say is that Tim is one of us. Tim is trained in medicine and pediatrics. He's a practicing primary care physician. He gets it, he's one of us, and it's a tremendous honor to, to present him to you for the Malcolm Peterson Honorary Lecture. Tim. What a pleasure, um, what an extreme honor it is to be here. Um, I'm gonna just try to open up my uh, laptop here and, um, and get started. So um, I'm taking a little bit of a risk here. I, um, I realized a couple days ago that, that my usual talk about health policy wasn't gonna work in this setting. And I would describe what I'm about to do more as a fireside chat than a lecture. And I'm particularly glad that I made that decision after hearing those amazing abstracts because I would not want to compete with what you just heard. They were, um, they were really tremendous. So, um, uh, so Steve, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, Marshall, um, friends and colleagues uh, in general medicine, I'm really honored to be speaking to you this morning. I attended my first SGIM in 1995 and knew then that I had found my people. Doctors who loved caring for their patients but also had broad interests in policy, social determinants, epidemiology, IT, and disparities. I found a strong sense of social justice, a nerd's appetite for data and analytics. My kids tell me that nerd is, is a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, uh, and a passion for passing on knowledge and expertise in the, to the next generation. At this event, our potlatch, we exchange ideas just as the Chinook of the Pacific Northwest exchanged valuables at their potlatch. This annual exchange brings us together as a community and I am proud to be GIM. So I did not know Malcolm Peterson, but from my reading and from speaking to some of my colleagues who did know him, I wish I had. He seems to have fit this description of general in internal medicine that I just um, uh, provided. Having said that, I consider myself an unlikely Peterson speaker. Over a decade ago, seems a long time, um, I mostly, uh, uh, I just lost my place. Um, uh, I mostly left the world of research where we assess ourselves on original insights and being right, and join the world of management where we assess ourselves on getting things done. Having some experience in both worlds has changed my impression of both, and I hope to spend a few minutes reflecting on this at the end. So to get started, a couple weeks ago I was rounding on a Sunday morning and stepped off an elevator. I passed a senior mass general surgeon who is on record as objecting to the fact that all clinical revenue at Mass General Hospital is taxed in order to pay for the infrastructure necessary to provide population health services. With a genuinely friendly smile, and I mean that, a genuinely friendly smile, 
he said to me, so I guess today you're practicing individual health. Yes, individual medicine. So we all know the challenging and reward and how rewarding it can be to have a sick patient ask us for help, to care for those patients one after another, some of whom have problems we cannot solve. This work calls on our training, skill, intelligence, and empathy. And no matter how much the trappings of care delivery change, the special relationship, a relationship based on trust between those who suffer and those who help them, will continue to thrive. Will continue to be among the most rewarding ways any person can devote their time. This year's SGIM theme is population health, but I have started with a description of caring for individuals because, well, much of the trappings of care delivery are changing, and there seems to be a lot more change ahead. Change creates anxiety, and the rhetoric starts to heat up. Small changes are portrayed as the end of all that is right and good. And I've heard it. People start making predictions and taking sides. So there are lots of people, both inside and outside healthcare, who are saying the sky is falling, or to update that, Voldemort has returned. <laughs> so I wanted to start by assuring you and everyone that everyone I know in policy and economics thinks primary care and general internal medicine needs more resources, not less. The disagreements are about methods, how we get there, not the need and not the values. So even if the rhetoric sometimes seems combative, antagonistic, and frankly scary, the basics of humans helping those who are suffering are not under assault. No matter what happens to the payment system or the organization of care delivery, the essential value of the services you provide will continue to be recognized and rewarded. So I would like everyone in the audience to take a deep breath and feel good about who you are and what you are doing and the future of doing it. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, there are changes. Let's start with the underlying issues in play in U.S. healthcare. This will be a review for most of you, but I find it useful to go back to the basics, and my particular, or I might say peculiar take on the basics may help explain the thoughts that follow. So as a setup to thinking about how to get more value from the delivery of healthcare services, those jargon words, to actually improve the health of the population, let's use that old tried and true heuristic, access, quality, and cost, and uh, add that newly popular fourth element, workforce. So access. I remember when my last uninsured patient got insurance in 2007, thanks to Romneycare. All that precious time spent in visits talking about insurance and finance issues melted away. That was a good thing. I was talking about healthcare and not insurance and finance issues, which I spent a lot of time in my Everett Health Center doing. And I will say bad debt at safety net hospitals declined dramatically across Massachusetts. So the ACA, for all its warts, has dramatically reduced uninsurance in the US, nearly half the problem solved. Not a panacea and lots of implementation challenges, but progress nonetheless. Despite this progress, lots of work left to do on access. There are still uninsured, and increasingly, there are underinsured. And there is another access issue looming, an access issue that the US as a whole has not faced in over 40 years. The aging of the population and the illness burden that will accompany it will strain the capacity of our hospitals and workforce to meet the demand. Maybe I can do the first slide. There we go. So um, here you see, um, it's much better in animation, you can Google this um, uh, slide, but the top just shows that the um, 76, 2000, and 2014, the aging of the population. And, um, and I like to point out that um, uh, you, you always try to anchor things with, with your own personal experience, and I, I hope I can, uh, is there a pointer on here? Oh, this is the pointer. 
um, that I happen to be right here. So I happen to be at the very, very end of the baby boom. But this is dramatic, this um, acceleration phase, and we are right in the early phase of that acceleration. It is going to change the demographics of the United States dramatically, and it's gonna change our jobs dramatically. So this problem is, is, is approaching very rapidly. Over 10,000 US citizens are turning 65 every single day. So now quality. The frontispiece to Michael Crichton's first book, the only one that was not a bestseller, it was called Five Patients, he wrote it when he was a medical student, um, has two quotes. To paraphrase, the first quote says, only doctors and nurses can change healthcare. Only doctors and nurses can change healthcare. The second quote points out that healthcare is far too important, important to be left to doctors and nurses. I think Dr. Kreit chose to juxtapose these state statements to illustrate the well-known paradox of the delivery of services, any services, by professionals who have an asymmetric relationship, a differential in knowledge. Without that knowledge, how does someone know if what they're receiving is high quality? Well, trust has been important. But with healthcare at 17% of GDP, the largest industry in the US economy, a lot of people outside healthcare have been saying, trust, yes, but verify. The fact is that it is not okay for us to be complacent about the rates of cancer screening, primary prevention, secondary prevention, a host of other things. When I observe the high burden and low impact of ambulatory performance reporting on HEDA scores, sorry, Zuri. I cannot escape the conclusion that claims-based reporting by payer is not the way to measure and improve health care, let alone population health. At MGH and the Brigham, we have found that with the right data properly presented and the right practice-based supports, we can measurably improve the health care and, importantly, the health of the patients we care for. We have learned a lot from these early efforts, all well-intentioned, and the way forward now seems fairly clear. Measuring quality is a necessary part of our future, but we need to do it well, and we need to use the information for assurance and improvement and not punishment. A final point about quality. What continues to alarm me most are the deep disparities in health in this country. Well illustrated on the Commonwealth Fund's uh, Health System Data Center website, and in Victor Fuchs' 2014 JAMA viewpoint titled Critiquing U.S. Healthcare. While the healthcare delivery system is not going to solve this widening dispar disparity problem without help from government and private sectors, this is clearly where we need to focus our attention. So now cost. The basics are well known. Costs rising at twice general inflation are crowding out other services provided by government, lowering wages of U.S. workers, and making U.S. goods less competitive overseas. This situation prompted Bill Gates to quip that the most serious problem facing the United States of all of our problems is the cost of health care. Many economists agree. As for the causes, you know these quite well, aging, innovation, and waste. Arguments about the relative size of these I find a bit tedious. All three are clearly contributing, and only two of them are modifiable. So we best get to work. Most pundits also point to the fee-for-service system as the engine of avoidable utilization. And while the evidence for this is incontrovertible, none of the alternatives are free of serious problems. Any physician here over 45 will recall that we tried capitation once and it did not go well. Current forms of alternative payments have done a pretty good job of navigating some of the pitfalls that we ran into in the 90s, but population-based payment methods have their own set of challenges. So while I think arguments about trade-offs under different payment systems are important, it is clear there is not a perfect solution. Finally, workforce. Most physicians I know are trying their best and working harder than is healthy for them or their families. 
Punishing physicians with high stakes report cards and financial penalties makes for good business school case studies, but is not a productive, sustainable solution. It's a good point to pause on that, but I actually lost my place. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so if you combine these four issues, the aging of the population, creating capacity and access pressures, well-documented and at times outrageous problems with the delivery of care, the unsustainable cost growth exceeding inflation, and an already overburdened workforce, I cannot escape the conclusion that care needs to be organized and delivered differently. So now, now that you have my impressions of the basics, what should, be the, what should the delivery of care look like? What should we do? What follows may be a little like the scene in The Wizard of Oz when Toto pulls back the curtain, because the care of the future looks a lot like the sum of all the things you have been working on for the past 30 years. You have been systematically identifying gaps in care and testing solutions. When I look at the posters and the presentations here and those over the past 20 years, one could evilly, um, sorry, Tom Inouye, I should say past 40 years, right? Um, uh, one could easily come to the conclusion that SGIM members are the intel inside the transformations that are occurring in U.S. healthcare. I will illustrate this with a slide I extracted from yesterday's workshop. Oh, actually, I'm going to go two slides ahead and then move one slide back. So this is a, um, a, a slide, I mean, if you came to the workshop, this is a, a summary slide abstracted from the data we presented yesterday. But this is five academic medical centers, large academic medical centers in the United States, and a, um, a, a categorization of everything those five uh, ACOs are doing to change the way healthcare is delivered. And if you just quickly peruse the, um, the column that has the details in the slides, there is not one thing on this list that there aren't posters about and presentations about in this um, symposium. And I checked, I looked through. Like everything here is the stuff that you guys are working on and have been working on. It is not strange or foreign. It is not even scary in its content. But there is a difference because this is taking your work to scale. And based on the comments that I've heard um, at, at Abstracts, that's, that, that some people here think that's premature. And maybe that's right. And you will notice also in the, in the graphic that we're not all doing the same thing at the same time but we're all traveling our own path from what we started out with and what our contracts dictate us to implement first and second and third. So the path is different, but the basic content um, is, is strikingly similar. So at the core of this work is shoring up the infrastructure within primary care to make this a tenable, rewarding career, including making it through the current IT slough of despond. You can Google that phrase if you want to know where it comes from. Um, providing care management services for our sickest, most vulnerable patients, spreading specialty skills over a much wider base, facilitating access to their expertise and not gatekeeping, and providing patients and dramatically more convenient access to healthcare. This is not scary. So one way to visualize what I'm trying to communicate is to use what I consider to be a Hall of Fame paper. So those of you will recognize uh, um, Oops. Um, uh, White's uh, 61 New England Journal paper, The Ecology of Medical Care. This is a, 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 I use this paper a lot. This is a great paper to think about the delivery of health services to a population. I, um, uh, I don't have time to, to go over it, but just say you take 1,000 people and you divide up how do they get their health care. How sick are they and how do they get their health care. This uh, paper was updated by Green um, uh, in uh, New England Journal in 2001. There's more categories, there's more services being provided. What I'm saying to you is that the healthcare of the future is going to add some more categories to this. And it's going to look a little bit like, you know, 
visit alternatives to primary care doctors. And it's going to say specialty visit alternatives, like e-consults. And it's going to have hospital alternatives, like hospitalization at home. It is going to continue a progression that has already been going on for decades. And that is, can be summarized as mass customization. Too much of what we do is a one-size-fits-all approach. And that's because the payment system has been encouraging us, actually incenting us, to use a one-size-fits-all approach. We've got to be much more subtle in addressing the cost pr problem and the workforce issues. So now I think I get to talk about Mora. So um, my patient, Mora, she's 46. She has CF at age 18. She received a liver lung transplant. Uh, one of the first performed at Mass General. She was married, has a foster child. Over the past decade, she has had significant cognitive decline from all her meds, renal failure, seizure disorder. When I met her in 2007, the prior year looked like this slide. Whoops. Um, so the upper line here is, um, you know, every clipboard is a visit uh, to a doctor. Um, every emergency room is a visit to emergency room and, the, and uh, three hospitalizations. She got a care manager, social worker, and the, what is shown below are the phone calls, that's an iPhone, um, and uh, much fewer doctor uh, visits, one emergency room visit, and no hospitalizations. Okay, so here I am. I'm at SGIM. This is an anecdote, right? This is not evidence-based. And I know what regression to the mean is. Okay, you're not going to get me on that one. All right. But from our prospective match trial with an independent evaluation showing a 7% net lowering of costs, a 4% mortality reduction, and a 3 to 1 ROI, I am done looking for evidence of effectiveness. I am focused. Thank you. I am focused instead on getting this to the thousands of people who could benefit from it. And at Partners, we now have over 10,000 people benefiting from this. And on continuously improving the, tar the, the, pr the process, and I get it, we have tons of work to do on improving this, better targeting, yep, all that. Um, but we're doing it. It's time to put it in place. Now, same with shared decision making, over 20 years of trials. Same with other interventions on the list you saw, right? So um, sure, there are lots of questions to be answered, and we won't always get it right, especially right away. But it's time to step up and use the research to make a difference. And now we have a great idea in real time to make sure we have great data in real time to make sure we are getting the results we want, the results we need. And in case you missed it, these last words were spoken by the senior vice president and not the associate professor. And this, um, this administrator um, lives with John Eisenberg's voltage drops in service delivery paper every single day. This Hall of Fame paper, I can think of no better single encapsulation of that term implementation science than uh, John Eisenberg's voltage drops paper. So to summarize, Act one, change is happening, yes, but you can relax. Your talents will be valued, possibly even more than they are now. Act two, this new stuff is actually stuff we've been experimenting with for decades, plus some cool IT stuff that has yet to be invented. And now it's time to put it to work in a real way. So on to act three. And I'm out of time. OK, I'm going to go really quickly through act three. So how do we get from where we are now to where we need to go? the path for adopting and sustaining new care models. It is not clear. That's the scary part. Um, and even more concerning, there are plenty of opportunities for missteps. So first, a few words about the financing. Alternative payment mechanisms are the dominant path to fix the fee-for-service ills. As we go down with this path, we must be sure not to repeat the mistakes of the 90s. I see many challenges, but three stand out. First, you will recall in opening I mentioned that the important patient-physician bond of trust. Survey evidence suggests that patients strongly dislike, very strongly dislike, any discussion of financial incentive for their physicians. On the other hand, shouldn't patients be informed if their physician 
is going to make money personally by not ordering a test or sending them to a less expensive doctor. This is a big challenge for us going forward. Possibly just as important, financing systems that by design create winners and losers are not sustainable. I made that point. Third, there is a looming challenge of too much administrative complexity. Extremely well-intentioned smart people have created enormously complex programs. Who here has read the MACRA proposed rule? Good. Don't. <laughs> I have read it. Oh my goodness. All right, so behavioral economists say incentives should be based on metrics that are under the control of the incentive group, are meaningful in their size, and are delivered close in time to the measured performance. The MIPS and macro proposals and the proposed rules violate all three of those. Good luck. I'm, I'm still for it, by the way, but good luck to all of us. It's going to be a challenge. On the other hand, a large delivery system can better manage complexity and, and the process requirements for delivering the kind of environment that we need. So to create our physician quality incentive system at Mass General Hospital, we needed 71 distinct measurement units. That is, people to compare people to, physicians to compare physicians. 71 distinct measurement units. And we cycle the incentives twice a year. In a survey we conducted, 88% of our docs thought the incentive system was effective at improving care and chose to continue the incentive system rather than have the money put straight into their compensation. That is an endorsement of a process. Given how difficult it is to manage this program in a way that works for our doctors, I am frankly skeptical that the federal government is going to be able to pull off something similar on a national scale. Despite these challenges and others, I remain supportive of the overall report, approach. In our early experience, I see so much productive change going on, so much better, more efficient care, and even small signs of measurably improved health, that at least so far, the juice seems to be worth the squeeze. I had some comments on uh, measuring quality. I think I'll skip those in the interest of time. Um, I think I already made the, the key point. Um, uh, so, um, so at this point, you would be quite right to ask, uh, with all this uncertainty and potential for major problems, why should we not oppose the current process? In 1998, I had the good fortune of hearing Ted Kennedy tell the story of his self-described worst mistake. Kennedy successfully opposed Richard Nixon's attempt to expand Medicare coverage because it did not go far enough and because it was not Ted Kennedy's plan. He noted that tens of millions of uninsured US citizens would have had health insurance for decades, but because he allowed the perfect to be the enemy of the good, he was personally responsible for millions of lives devastated for lack of health insurance. I find this story a sobering reminder that we cannot know the future and extreme positions that do not allow for compromise can be deeply injurious to progress in ways that we cannot know for a long time to come. So one of my favorite quotes is from Kant. I know he's not really popular these days. Out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. It is clear that the path forward will not be straight but with continued vigilance on the people, from the people in this room, our physician colleagues more generally, because frankly, I think it's better not to turn the guns inward, um, and the economists and policy wonks who really, really want to get this right for us and for our children, we will address the challenges in front of us through slow but steady progress in, tr in transforming how healthcare is delivered, and in doing so, we will improve the health of the population. Thank you.